Tick tock, time to rock. So, oh, man. You know, I don't see myself on the screen. Oh, there. All right, that was Hold On, I'm Coming by the R&B group, Sam and Dave. And speaking of Sam and Dave, I am David Wood, your friendly neighborhood philosopher. And with me is Triple B, the Assyrian Encyclopedia, Sam Shamoon himself. We are two days away from Christmas. So we're going to be talking about the deity of Christ and the incarnation. Now, yes, I know some of you are saying, hey, wait a minute. Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Christ, not the incarnation. But come on, you know what we're talking about here. You know, we're talking about the divine son entering creation. And this is when people become uh, aware of it, unless you had a special message by an angel before him. All right. Well, we are going to be taking questions on the deity of Christ and the incarnation. So if you want to start posting those, you can. We'll be taking other questions as well, but we'll give special preference to uh, questions on this topic. Uh, just let me uh, do just let me do the uh, sound check here at the beginning. I'm assuming everyone can hear me because I don't see complaints. Everyone hear me? Just let me know real quick that, that the sound is clear. Sam, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself so we can check your right. sound as well. All right, well, just let's invoke the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bless this session, bless David and I, and bless those who will be listening. Anoint us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wash us in the blood of Jesus and purify us in the blood of Jesus and anoint us to speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus. May he increase in us, may we decrease, and bless your people and bless our family members, Father. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. In my case, my daughters and the mother, for your glory. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Fill us, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Yep. Amen. All right. Well, let's see. Everyone's saying they can hear us. All right. Sound is clear. Sound is clear. Sound is clear. People say the sound is clear. All right. Well, um, I did have a comment that I wanted to address, Sam. It's uh, from a, uh, a former Muslim um, who became a Christian, but then is, is sort of struggling with uh, some, some Christian doctrines. So I uh, wanted to address that, but there were so many issues that uh, were being asked that I thought we might as well uh, do a separate show and start off with that because it addresses things like um, like hell and like the, the reliability of the scriptures and so on. So it was a lot of a lot of different issues. So we're going to go ahead and you still good for you still good for Wednesday? Lord willing, yeah, I mean, I got nothing but. Time to serve Jesus, our Lord and Savior, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah. I okay, be good. so if, uh, if uh, I don't know if I want to use names yet. If the person who sent that message and I said we would respond um, is free on Wednesday, we'll be addressing that 8 o'clock p.m., so uh, please tune in there. But here yeah. we wanted to focus on some issues relating to the deity of Christ and the incarnation. And notice we, in, we, in, we invite Muslims to... Uh, bring their challenges. And this is one of the main, main areas that Muslims usually bring up. In fact, they will usually bring this up no matter what issue you're talking about, right? You could say, hey, why did Muhammad have sex with a nine-year-old girl? Well, what about the incarnation, right? They'll start complaining about it. How, how can you believe that, that God became a man? How can you believe that God died? How can you believe that God came out of a woman? How can you believe, how can you believe all these kinds of things? So Sam, uh, before we actually get into some issues, and, and uh, one was actually uh, posted here, there was a question here before the show even started. Yeah. Um, so we'll go ahead and start off with that. But why don't you tell everyone why this is such a, an important issue for Christians and why it's a, such an important area of, of disagreement for Muslims? Because <clears throat> the whole heart of the New Testament revelation, not just the Gospels, is that in the person of Jesus Christ, God became a flesh and blood human being for manifold reasons. <clears throat> One of the main reasons is to reveal God as he is <clears throat> on a level in which we can grasp the true God. I mean, obviously, God is beyond comprehension. We won't fully understand him, but we can get a true understanding of who he is in the person of Jesus, because Jesus is God in the flesh and the only perfect revelation of God to mankind. And another reason why <clears throat> the incarnation is important is because this teaches that God in his infinite love for a fallen world entered into the world to do for the world what the world could not do for itself, redeem it from the power of sin and Satan and from God's righteous judgment. So, there are many fold reasons, but those are the two main ones. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to Islam, for them, God does not enter into creation as a man and would never die for his creation because they believe 
that God is too transcendent, too majestic above and beyond doing such things. And, so this and, is and, the and by the way, even if even if God weren't so transcendent that he's above such things, he wouldn't do it because he just doesn't love people enough yeah. to do that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. No, he yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. That's another good one. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and go to our first comment. Might as well start with this one because he, uh, Andre here raises up uh, a lot of the standard issues. So, Sam, yes, you're going to be stumped here. Maybe. Andre says Christ is not God. Okay. He had a God and prayed to the God, Yeah. went to God, and sits at the right hand of God. So this doesn't sound like a Muslim if he's acknowledging that uh, Jesus sits at the right hand of God, so probably a Unitarian or, uh, or something else. Um, but let's go ahead and go through. Now, now by the way, the, the problem here, the, the, the problem right off the bat that I see, right? If you go to certain passages of the Bible and you ignored all the rest of Scripture, if you ignored all the rest of Scripture, you would say, oh, okay, well, here, Jesus is sent by God, or he's called the Son, or the Word, or something like that. Well, obviously, he's, he's different from, from God. But that's not all of Scripture, right? If we go to the rest of Scripture, then you find, you, you find you've got a couple things. One, you've got Jesus claiming to be God. And two, you, claim it, you have Jesus claiming to be distinct from the Father and distinct from the Holy Spirit. And then three, you have this idea, I don't know of a good word for it, of a kind of a, I've seen it called fromness, right? That, that in some way he is, he is from, he is from God or, or from the Father in the sense of, if you think of the word of God, that's something that God is, is speaking or something like that. And so Jesus is somehow from. And so it's, it's taking all of those together. That's where, that's where you get the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Yes, you can zero in and ignore everything else. For instance, if you, if you only went to passages where Jesus is claiming deity and ignored everything else, you'd say, oh, okay, Jesus is, is God and that's it. Um, so Sam, let's go ahead and, uh, and run through these. Um, so he says, yeah. he says, Christ is not God. So yes. do, you, uh, do you disagree with that? Uh, of course, I definitely disagree with it because it contradicts scriptures. And again, everything good and perfect that comes from us is because of the grace of the Holy Spirit. So we trust the Holy Spirit to enable us to answer these questions accurately for the glory of Jesus Christ. He says Jesus can't be God because the argument, if you actually read it because you posted it, is because he's distinguished from God. So if Jesus is dis distinguished from God, he cannot be God. I'm going to give the example of Adam and Eve in order to illustrate this point because if you go to Genesis 1, God created Adam to be the most perfect expression of God's plurality and unity in finite form. In other words, Adam is not identical to God because he's finite, he's temporal, but he is the most perfect expression of God in finite form. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> well, go to Genesis 1, to 27. And David, do you want me to read or do you want to read it? What did you say? Genesis 1, to 27. You want me to read or you want uh, you want to read it? It's up to you, bro. Whatever is easier. No, I'll, no, I'll go. Um, I just oh, had to, I just I had to pull up Bible Gateway. Forgive me, okay. forgive me once again. I was pulling I was pulling up uh, I was pulling up the the Bible. You said yeah. go to Genesis. Yeah, one twenty six twenty seven. Let me repeat okay. what I just said. I don't want to confuse people. There's nothing identical to God in creation. There are things that are similar to God, but not identical to God. So I don't want people to misrepresent what I said. I'm not saying Adam is identical to the way God exists. What I'm saying is that Adam is the most complete, perfect expression of God. God's plurality and unity in a finite being, in finite form. So I don't want people saying, oh, Sam said that Adam is identical to God in the way God exists. No, that's not my point. But you'll see what my point is as we unpack this by the grace of God's Spirit. Just read 26 real quickly. Just from Genesis 1, 26. Because people, when they rush through the text, they mm -hmm. miss these key points. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, 26, what does it say? Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, notice, this is the first time in the narrative, and those of you who are serious Bible students, I know I'm preaching to the choir, David knows this, first time in the narrative that God speaks in the plural. Every other creative act, God simply says, let there be, right? But for some reason, and the reason will become obvious as we unpack it, when it comes to Adam, and by the way, the Hebrew word for man is Adam. So I'm going to stick with the word Adam. Let us make Adam in our image. 
When it comes to creation of Adam, he changes the language and now speaks in the plural and invites others to assist him in the creation of Adam. But people miss it. It says, let us create Adam, make Adam in our image, in our likeness. And then it says, let them have dominion. Now, I want everyone to catch this. Adam is actually a plural <clears throat> being in the sense that that one Adam is now them. Pay attention to the text. Let us make man Adam in our image. Let them have dominion. So the one Adam right off the bat is depicted as being more than one person. Now, that's confirmed in verse 27. Notice what 27 says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Pause right there, David. Did you catch the word man again is Adam? The Adam that was created in the image and likeness of the one God. Because now notice in 27, he was created in the image of God, right? Not various gods in his own image, not their images, because the one God who created Adam is not a plurality of gods, though he's a plurality of persons. And I'll unpack that. But notice the Adam there is male and female together. Now, what am I trying to get at? Right here in Genesis 1, we see that Adam who is deliberately made to reflect God to some extent, the most perfect expression of God in finite temporal form, is a plurality. He's not a singularity. The one Adam is male and female, a community of persons of like essence, being a reflection of the fact that the one God who made Adam is also a community of persons of like essence. Even though the divine person of the Godhead, they're not finite, they're not temporal, they're not limited to time, space, and place. This is why I said Adam's existence is not identical to God, but in some sense, it's similar. And what are the similarities? The one Adam is more than one person, a community of persons of like essence in communion and fellowship. As a reflection of the one God being a community of divine persons of like essence in communion and fellowship. Now, why did I bring this up? Many people may not be aware, but Eve's initial name, if you actually read the scriptures, Genesis 1, 2, 3, and you go to 5, there are actually three names given to Eve. You have Eve being called woman, Isha, in Genesis chapter 2 by Adam. But then after the fall, again, Adam names her Eve, but initially her name was Adam. And let me prove that by going to Genesis 5, verses 1 or 2. Now you're going to see where I'm going with this, because this is going to be a befitting analogy to Jesus being distinct from God and yet God at the same time. Because I'm going to use the example of Eve. Even though, remember, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Adam, mankind, is a finite, temporal, limited expression of the infinite being we call God. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But nonetheless, he's meant to reflect God's existence to some extent. And I highlighted some of the ways in which our existence is similar to God. In Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2, let me repeat the point. Eve was initially called Adam like her husband was. The male is called Adam. The female is called Adam. That's why in Genesis 1, we're told that the Adam that God created is a plural them, male and female, which is confirmed in Genesis 5, verses 1 to 2. Read that first, David, if you don't mind. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. And the footnote there is the word for you, man here is Adam. You got it. See, that's why in the King James, it, it helps out a little more. It, this is the book of the generations of Adam. That's how your translation read. In the day that God created man, people may not know it's Adam again. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew there, in the, the day that God created Adam, in the likeness of God, may he to him. So notice Adam is singular, right? Him. Male and female, he created them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Wait, how can Eve be Adam and yet she's distinct from Adam and married to Adam? So let me now take John 1.1 1, 1 and paraphrase it and apply it to Eve. In the beginning, there was Eve and Eve was with Adam and Eve was Adam. You see? So you see why I took a little extra time to unpack this? What's the point? Just like Eve can be Adam in one sense and distinct from Adam in another sense, mm -hmm. she's Adam in the sense that she possesses the nature of Adam, because the word Adam means humanity, mankind, and yet she was married to another who was also Adam in essence and whose name was Adam. Jesus can be distinguished from God 
and yet be God in essence, because the God that he's distinguished from is the Father. And none of us believe that Jesus is the Father, though he possesses the essence of of the father he's not the same person as the father like eve possesses the essence of adam who she's married to because she came out of him though she's not him so just like you can have eve who is adam and distinct from adam you can have jesus who is god distinct from god where is the problem mm -hmm. all right so sam now uh just briefly you you, you gave us a you, you gave us a good explanation of the uh, doctrine that we believe in. Now, just briefly address those other issues in light of what you just said. So yep. Christ is not God um, yes. because he had a God and prayed to God, went to God and sit at the right hand of God. And as you just pointed out, um, if we just focused on Eve um, being a different human being from Adam, her husband, then you'd have to say, well, she's not Adam, but the Bible says she is Adam. And so it's uh, talking about different uh, different things here. So uh, briefly, how would you respond to he had a God, he prayed to God, went to God and sit at the right hand of God in light of the distinctions you just made? Yes, because the God that he prays to is the father. The God at whose right hand he sits is the father. And yet... <clears throat> Since we don't believe Jesus is the Father, but distinct from the Father, we have no problem with Jesus praying to the Father, worshiping the Father, because don't forget what we're celebrating, that Jesus Christ, who is the eternal Son, the eternal Word, who's fully God in essence, yet distinct from the Father, became flesh. He became man as God intended man to be. He is the perfect human being in the sight of God. So when I say perfect human being, we're talking about, talking about from God's perspective. Now, would the perfect human being from God's perspective be godless, sinful, wicked, a lawbreaker who doesn't care about God, who doesn't commune with God, who doesn't worship God? That would be a wicked sinner. Yet Jesus is the perfect man, man as God intended man to be. So as man, he worships the Father as man, he prays to the Father because he's not the Father, though he possesses the same essence that the Father does. So we're Trinitarians, three distinct persons, an eternal communion and fellowship. And we further believe that Jesus Christ, the Son, not the Father, not the Spirit, became flesh. And he became the perfect human. And the perfect human worships God. As James White says, he's not an atheist. Mm -hmm. so where's, where's the problem again? All right, so Andre, I expect we'll be seeing, uh, hearing from you again as uh, as I go through the comments. But yeah, if you are, if you actually believe in the scripture, and it sounds like you might, you you've got some you've got some issues, and you might want to read these passages uh, a little more carefully. Yeah, just let me add one more thing because he said Jesus has a God. We addressed this in a previous session, mm -hmm. but we're creatures of repetition, and we have to repeat something over and over again until, by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature. Why would the Father be Jesus as God? And I explained this in, I think, maybe two, three sessions back. Because he became flesh. John 1.14 says, The eternal Word, who was there with the Father, in communion with the Father in eternity, fully God in essence, who created all things, became flesh. This is what we're celebrating. Incarnation. That's even the, the title of tonight's session. Incarnation. Incarnate. In the flesh. According to Jeremiah 32.27, Jeremiah 32.27, it says that Jehovah is the God of all flesh. He some, goes, did I. You see, did you say some flesh? No, did I say some flesh? No, I said. No, no, no I'm, I'm just saying. Did you, you didn't say some oh, flesh, right? Oh, yeah, you confused me. I got scared. No, uh, all flesh. Oh, all flesh. All flesh. So that would include the incarnate son. You better believe it. Okay. So if the incarnate son, the son becomes flesh. And again, he's not the father and he's not the spirit. And the father is Jehovah. And yet, though Jesus is Jehovah, he became flesh, not the Father. Why would we be surprised that from the time of the Son becoming flesh, in flesh, the Father would begin to relate to him as his God? If the Father is Jehovah, and Jehovah is the God of all flesh, and the Word became flesh, then we'd expect the Father to start relating to the Word, who is now flesh, as his God, because Jesus is the God-man. So again, where's the problem? All right. Well, uh, now we have a question from a Muslim, Sam, and... This isn't uh, clearly about the deity of Christ, but yes. it's uh, it's in the same ballpark, and we do want to address quite honest questions from from Muslims. There are times Muslims are just uh, over here mocking or tossing around insults, but 
Uh, if we have a, a straightforward question, um, love to go ahead and answer these. So, question from a Muslim. If Jesus, peace be upon him, was going to die for our sins, what is the reason he sent us to earth? Now, now notice, it, it, it seems like he has an Islamic view, right, of, of human beings, right, uh, that we were sent here to earth. Right now, 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 Sam. Just but before we continue with this question, um, according to Islam, human beings are created in, par in paradise and then were sent to Earth as punishment. Right? Yeah. That according to the Quran, Jannah is supposed to be is supposed to be not on Earth but in paradise, and that's where Adam and Eve were expelled. They're expelled from a heavenly paradise to earth, which introduces all sorts of contradictions with chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 30 to 34. But if you want, we can defer it to another session where we can talk mm -hmm. about contradictions in the Quran. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the Islamic view. And uh, our Muslim friend here seems to think that it's also the Christian view. What is the Christian view of the creation of man? No, <laughs> the Genesis chapter 2 is quite clear. The Garden of Eden, paradise, was located on earth. It even mentions four rivers that came out of the garden, two of which we know to be the Euphrates River, and, and one of them even is a river that runs into Egypt. So it's not a heavenly paradise. It's an earthly one. Man was created from the earth to dwell on the earth. He wasn't created in paradise so that he could then eventually dwell on the earth. And this is what I was alluding to earlier, that the Quran's depiction of the creation of man is incoherent and full of contradictions because man was created for the earth. That's what chapter 2, verse 30 says, that God was going to create man to be his vice regent on the earth. And yet, for some reason, man ends up being created in paradise in Jannah, which then makes me wonder, is there mud? Is there clay in Jannah? Because it says Allah fashioned man from mud, from clay. Where did that mud and clay come from? So what is he doing in, in heaven when he's supposed to be on earth? And where in the world did he get the clay from? Is there mm -hmm. clay in paradise? Yeah, anyway, yep, I've got some issues there. <laughs> Uh, now, the, the, the point of the question is, uh, if Jesus was going to die for our sins, what is the reason he sent us to earth? So you got to correct that. So what is the reason he created us on earth or something like that? Um, earth is pointless, according to Christianity. You are supposed to work for heaven. So, uh, Sam, is yeah. earth pointless, according to yeah. Christianity, because Jesus dies for sins? No, because this, again, is a fundamental difference between Christians and Muslims. And even some Christians have the er erroneous view that when believers die, they go to heaven, we stay in heaven. It is true that until Jesus returns from heaven to the earth, we who are believers, when we die, our spirits leave our bodies, enter Christ's heavenly presence, and we enjoy him as disembodied spirits so we're all going to be spirits there but our spirits will have a form and shape of some kind by which we can recognize one another even though we don't have a physical body but the message of the bible here's where joe's witnesses are partially correct shocking i know joe's witness is correct here's where joe's witnesses are partially correct <clears throat> the lord jesus will take all the inhabitants of heaven meaning human believers who exist with him as disembodied spirits bring them to the earth, raise their bodies, and the day will come where he'll transform the earth itself to be the abode of righteousness so that glorified believers in glorified bodies will dwell with the Godhead on earth forever and ever. So our ultimate destiny is not heaven out there, the spiritual dimension. Because according to Revelation 21 and 22, you can read it. Just read the first four verses of Revelation 21. Heavenly Jerusalem comes down to the earth, and God the Father joins His Son with the Spirit on earth. And the earth will no longer be <clears throat> the habitation for sin, wickedness, and death. That will be completely removed. So why did He create the earth? For us to live on the earth. <clears throat> so when He says that heaven is our destiny... That's the Islamic view. So mm -hmm. I can turn that question back to him. Oh, yeah. What in the world did Allah even waste his time creating an earth when at the end all of us will be in Jannah, in paradise, or in hell? What was the earth for? Mm -hmm. and, and, and Sam, just, just to be clear, the Islamic view is that Allah decided a long, long time ago where we're all going, right? So, so yes. this, was, yep. this is... This is uh, Allah knows forever where we're going, and so this earth... This earth has nothing to do with it, and the earth is pointless, according to Islam, yes. right? Yeah, that's a question I'd like the Muslim to answer, and I mean this sincerely. If there's a Muslim listening, 
since the well, we, we, we know we know there's a Muslim answering because the Muslim asked this question. Yeah, and, and, and um, again, he may not be not. He'll say, "I'm not knowledgeable." You mm-hmm. know, you need to ask a scholar. So, if there's a knowledgeable Muslim, let me qualify. If there's a knowledgeable Muslim, I really like you to answer the question. Since, according to Islam, the ultimate destiny of the believer is Jannah, meaning paradise in heaven, and unbelievers won't be dwelling on earth; they're going to go to hell. You know, Jahannam, Jahannam. Then, what in the world is Allah going to do with the earth? What happens mm-hmm. to the earth? And and salmon player, we want you to answer that, right? Because uh, we we gladly answered your question. Now now, as you've seen, the objection doesn't really apply to us, but it does apply to you. It does apply to you. So please answer the question for us. Let me, by the way, correct uh, one one. I believe he's a Christian. He said that this earth is reserved for fire, so it's not the same earth. He's quoting Second Peter three, and he's misunderstanding Second yep. Peter three. Read Second Peter 3 correctly. It even talks about the earth being destroyed by water, by flood, and this earth being destroyed by fire. I don't know of anyone who assumes that just because Peter said that the earth was destroyed by flood, that means the old earth vanished and a new earth was mm-hmm. sprung into being from nothing. Mm-hmm. So when it says that God is going to destroy the elements by fire, it doesn't mean he's going to wipe out this planet. He's going to purge this planet of its evil, purifying it to be the abode of absolute perfect righteousness. It doesn't mean this earth is going to be wiped out of existence and a new earth replacing it. Any more than when God flooded the first earth, he wiped that out and created a new planet in its place. That's a misreading of Second Peter chapter 3. So I just wanted to correct that. All right. And uh, by the way, Sam, there are a ton of questions over here now popping up on uh, on issues related to the deity of Christ. Um, Wait, get up. Let's go ahead and go through some of these. This is from Michael Levy. Um, is Jesus human nature a part of the Trinity? Obviously yeah. not. Um, but if not, and this is a good, this is a good question here. If not, how should we view his human nature in relation to the Trinity? So that now that Jesus, now that Jesus exists as a human being with a dual nature, how should we now understand his human nature as yes. it relates to the Trinity? Excellent. That's actually a question that was raised by Akil, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Excellent question. Before I answer the question, I always need to ask for definitions of terms. When you say, is the human nature of Christ, of Christ part of the Trinity? What do you mean part of? Do you mean physically a part of God in some material physical aspect? Well, God by nature is spirit. So, and again, I'm not trying to get technical or philosophical or try to speak beyond, you know, way over people's head, but these are questions that do entail we dig a little deeper to explain words and their meanings. Like when we say God is omnipresent, what do we mean by that? Well, if you mean he's present everywhere in a material sense, am I sitting on God? Is God this table? So again, we have to define our terms. When you say part of the Trinity, my first question is, what do you mean part of? Physically attached to God in some material, physical way? Well, God by nature is spirit, so he is immaterial incorporeal, right, <clears throat> non-spatial. So he can't be, the human nature of Christ can't be part of the God in that sense. If you're, if you're telling me, is the human nature of Christ a part of the God in the sense that Jesus taking on flesh <clears throat> and being inseparable from the Father and the Spirit, his physical body became a vehicle through which the Godhead worked, if that's what you mean. That, was the Father in some sense present in and through the Son, when the Son was incarnate on earth, was the Spirit present. Not that the Father became flesh, not that the Spirit became flesh, but since Christ is inseparable from the Father and the Spirit. And when He became flesh, did the Godhead operate, work in and through the physical body of Christ without the Father and the Spirit becoming flesh? The answer is yes, and it's not something I came up with. Jesus says it. In fact, David, if you don't mind, can you read John 10, 37-38? John 10, 37, 38. So I would ask you, define what you mean by part. The physical body of Christ is not physically attached to the Godhead in some physical material way. But that physical body was the vehicle through which the Godhead did work in and through, without the Father becoming a human being, without the Spirit becoming a human being. Think of it this way. Just as the Father works in and through me, without the Father being me, or the Father becoming flesh, The Father was working in and through the Son's physical body without Him being the Son, without Him being flesh. Was that clear, David, or am I confusing people? Mm -hmm. I mean, it it might be confusing just because you're talking about theology, but 
Um, yeah. I think I think people get the point. And just to confirm what I said, what does John 10, 37, 38 say? All right. Uh, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Hmm. So the Father is in me and I in the Father. Well, the Father is not the Son and he didn't become flesh. In him means that he's in union with him, working in and through his physical body, without him being the same as Christ or becoming flesh. Just like when the Spirit works in and through me, that doesn't make me the Holy Spirit, doesn't make the Holy Spirit me or the Holy Spirit flesh. But they did work and operate in and through Jesus' physical body. Now, if you don't mind, go to John 14. John 14, read verses 9 to 11. Now, if you want the context, we can start at 7. John 14, 7 to 11. I'm going to prove that the Father was working in and through the Son's physical body when the Son was on earth in flesh. And he's still flesh in heaven, which was the second part of the question. And the same is true of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to prove it from Scripture. John 14, 7 to 11, specifically 9 to 11, David, if you don't mind. All right, stop me wherever you want to come in. Yep. If you had known me, Jesus speaking, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. So believe wait, David. Good. Wait, wait, wait. Dave, David, Jesus said the Father is doing works through me physically? Mm -hmm. So you don't need to ask to see the Father. He's right here with you because he's in union with me, and he's working through me to do the miracles to convince you that I am the Son of the Father, right? Not, not that I am the Father, not that he became flesh, but he's right here working in and through me. I mean, clear as day, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So when you ask me, is the physical body of Christ a part of the Trinity. First define what you mean part of. The Father is not a physical material being, neither is the Spirit, nor is the Son in relation to his deity. The Son became flesh, and once he became flesh, because of his perfect union with the Father and the Spirit, the Father and the Spirit then used Jesus' physical body on earth to work in and through, bringing about the redemption of, of God's people. Now what about the Holy Spirit? John 14, 16 to 17, was the Spirit also operating in and through Christ, mm -hmm. without being Christ, without being flesh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, John 14, 16 to 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, I'm confused, David. In what sense was the Holy Spirit abiding with them? He goes, you know him already because he's here with you. What is he talking about? Where was he? He was there with Christ, upon Christ, operating through Christ with the Father. So, guys, you understand what that means? The entire Godhead was working on earth through the physical body of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing or what? Mm -hmm. And even Mark 1.10, if you know, if you go back and, I, and the preposition there is ace, it means when the Spirit came upon him, it can also be rendered, the Spirit came into him. Mark 1.10, at the baptism. When he descended in visible form as a dove, you can render the Greek preposition as the Spirit came into him. So, yes, in one way, the physical body is a part of the Godhead, in that the Godhead used Jesus' physical body on earth. The Father was operating through Jesus' physical body. The Spirit was operating through Jesus' physical body without the Father and the Spirit being Jesus or becoming flesh. So it depends on how you define the term. Now, was there a part, another part of the question? No, that was it. Okay. Then that's, I hope I answered. If she's here, she can tell me if that was satisfactory or not. Uh, it was Michael. Michael asked that question. Sorry, Michael. Apologize. Yeah. All right. And uh, as a little side note there, as a little side note, Sam, uh, we often point out the various ways that Muslims try to deify Muhammad. Yeah. Um, by calling Muhammad the comforter or the helper there of John 14, would they be once again deifying Muhammad? They would be making Muhammad omnipresent, omniscient, as well as omnipotent. Because the point of John 14, 17, Jesus is assuring the disciples, the time will come where I will physically leave you, 
but I'll still be present with the Spirit because the Spirit will then operate through you as He's been operating through me. That's why it says He'll be in all of you, meaning He'll be working in and through you as He's been working in and through me. So my question is, how can the Spirit operate in and through all the disciples simultaneously, no matter how numerous they are, no matter where they're at, if He's not omnipresent, omniscient, because He has to know who the disciples are, omnipotent because he's working through them to make sure they successfully accomplish God's will on earth. So if that's Muhammad, Muslims, you just turn Muhammad into a God alongside Allah because that means Muhammad is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Thank you, Muslims. And this argument comes from some of the most some of the most prominent Muslim apologists of all time. This is this is standard <laughs> claiming that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So this is a this is amazing stuff. That So can we say that Islam's top apologists, such as Ahmed Didak, Zakir Naik, Shabir Ali, all of whom have pointed to this passage in John 14 to say, this is talking about Muhammad. They, are, yep. they have all deified Muhammad and are guilty of the unforgivable sin shirk. You better believe. That's why I don't know where you're going with it. Yep, absolutely. They are now part of the mushrikeen. They are shirkers. Good job, you Muslim apologists. And they need forgiveness. Yeah. I suggest they look somewhere other than Islam because they keep for they they keep committing the sin of deifying Muhammad. They're going to have to look outside of Islam if they want true forgiveness from God for deifying Muhammad. Yep. Exactly. Now, Fourscore uh, says uh, <laughs> he just said the boys are back in town. Now, I'm boys not sure, back <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> it's it's there are like probably a dozen or more songs called The Boys Are Back in Town. Um, I hope he's going with the Bus Boys version. Maybe we'll uh maybe we'll start using that as a as a theme song here <laughs> here at the beginning. Because uh it, that actually is a good song. You don't know the Bus Boys version, Sam? It's a little okay. before your time. But uh yeah, just, yeah, yeah I know. But I want to just share with you, David. You, I want to tell you why Jonah had every reason for wanting the Ninevites destroyed. I have a fellow Ninevite here who's trying to Creep in and show his face and distract me. Yeah, so, do, do, do you want to? Do you want to? If he if he wants attention, do you want to give him attention and just take a he's moment been, to introduce him? No, he's now afraid. Oh, now he's he, scared. So he's trying to put his head in while we're talking about right. important theological issues. But now that we say, okay, you want you want attention, we're going to give you attention. Now he's scared to come on. Now you see why Jonah was justified, David. I don't blame him, man. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's yeah, yeah. No, the boys are back in town. Yeah, I remember that song. Wrong yeah, one, wrong one. Bus boy, go with the bus boys ver version. I don't know that. Because the boys are back in town. It's a much cooler song. It's your birthday. Yeah, all right, my birthday. All right, this is from uh, Leah. Leah said, "I debated with a Muslim, but it seems like her knowledge about the Quran is almost none." And by the way, that is that is pretty standard, right? Yep, it is. It's uh, common. Uh, Muslims parrot what they hear from either. Nayak or Didat or from their imams and <clears throat> really don't have any in-depth understanding of their own Islamic sources. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and by the way, I, I found that out through experience because the first couple of Muslims I talked to, well, one was an imam and one was Nabil, and th these were, these were well-versed Muslims. And so um, I assumed that Muslims really know, really know their scriptures and really know their arguments and so on. And it, it's just a common mistake people make because Muslims generally knew, do know their basic practices. Their leaders, their imams make sure they know, hey, you need to dress a certain way. You need to go to the mosque on, at certain times. You need to do these prayers during certain times. You need to fast during this time. And we see that Muslims are doing these basic practices and the assumption that's made is, wow, these Muslims really know their religion. And it was only, it was only, uh, once I started, um, once I started debating and a Muslim would come up to me after the debate and say, uh, hey, you were wrong about this, or I converted to Islam because of this. And I would start asking them basic questions and they had no clue what I was talking about. I would ask them about verses of the Quran. They had no clue what I was talking about. And I can't, th that was eventually I realized the general rule that Muslims very rarely know about their own scriptures, uh, very rarely know anything about Christianity. All they've been taught to do is parrot certain objections to Christianity. So they've been taught to say, well, if Jesus is God, how can he die? Or where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me, in those words. They've been taught basic things. And uh, the sad part is Christians don't always have an answer for these questions, and so Muslims keep getting away with it. Um, but if you 
do learn some basic answers to these simple questions, um, it's going to make things awkward for the Muslim because the Muslim doesn't know anything on any deeper level. Um, and to be, to be clear, that is not that is not universally true. You you will run into Muslims who do a lot of studying. I'm just saying uh, uh, the the average common situation is just as Leah is pointing out here. So she says, I debated with a Muslim, but it seems like her knowledge about the Quran is almost none and just mocking the Trinity and saying Bible is corrupted. I wonder if most of Muslims don't know their Quran. So we probably mm. agree with that, right, Sam? Yeah, the great bulk of Muslims don't know their Quran. So, and that's not just Sunni Muslims; it's across the board. Yes, mm -hmm. but like you said, the same is true among those who profess to be Christian. How many Christians really know their Bible, know their theology? And if they were articulate the Trinity, they would actually sound more modalistic than Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and uh, uh, so you, you've you've pointed out you've pointed out um, that your your friend basically mocks the Trinity and says that the Bible is corrupted. Now, what's cool is even though your friend doesn't know much. You actually have wonderful opportunities in situations like this that since your Muslim friend doesn't know much about what the Quran says, you can be the one who actually educates her. Right. In, in, in other words, uh, take the issue. The Bible's been corrupted. Right? Look up. Go, go to go to YouTube and type in the Islamic dilemma. I've got a short video on that. That's, I don't know, six or seven minutes long or something like that. Uh, Sam has entire lectures there. But you can actually use these situations where the your Muslim friend is just repeating the things she's heard from her Muslim friends, from her imam, from her parents, or from whoever. And as she's giving you these objections, you can then use those objections to show her that she doesn't know what she's talking about and that it's actually Islam that has a problem here. So if your friend says, ha, you've got a problem, your Bible's been corrupted, then you start giving her... Uh, chapter five, verse forty-seven. Chapter seven, verse one fifty-seven. You can you can start off even before that. You can go chapter three, verses three to four. Matter of fact, write these references down real quick. Surah three, verses three to four of the Quran says that Allah revealed the Torah and the Gospel. Uh, Surah seven, verse one fifty-seven says that Christians and Jews were still reading the Gospel and the Torah during the time of Muhammad. So notice these were preserved from the first all the way to the seventh century. Uh, you have Surah 18, verse 27, Surah 6, verses 114 to 115, which say that no one can change Allah's words, and that's in the context of Allah's scripture. And then you get to Surah 5, verse 43, and Surah 5, verse 47, which talks about uh, the Torah and the gospel still being authoritative for Jews and Christians, which it wouldn't be if they've been corrupted. And you can go to chapter 5, verse 68, which says that Jews and Christians have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to us. And go to 1094, where the previous scriptures, the scriptures of the Jews and, the Jews and Christians, the people of the book, were authoritative even over Muhammad himself, which they couldn't be if they'd been corrupted. Because um, Allah doesn't say, hey, Muhammad, you better go to the original Christian documents from several centuries ago and see if they line up. He tells, he tells Muhammad to go to the people of the book to make sure that his revelations line up with the revelations of the people of the book. That would only make sense if the people of the book still have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. So notice, now, there, there's nothing that I just said right there that you couldn't do. You, if you write down those references, there's nothing I just said that you couldn't bring to your Muslim friend and say, hey, you said the Bible's been corrupted. Well, if the Bible's been corrupted, if the Bible's been corrupted, you have a problem because your God affirms the inspiration and preservation and authority of my scriptures, scriptures which you just said are corrupted. Therefore, you're claiming to know more than your God. You're saying your God is wrong. You're saying the Quran is wrong. You're saying your God is incompetent. He's ignorant. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And so you've just acknowledged that Muhammad is a false prophet and that Allah is not the true God. Is that what you're saying? So notice, you can, you can wreak havoc. You could wreak havoc on a Muslim who really doesn't know what, what she's talking about. Uh, and Sam, by the way, Yes. Just very quickly. I mean, we, we're focusing on the deed of Christ, and I have a there, we have a we have a bunch of questions uh, already right here. But uh, tell tell Leah how she can turn this into an inescapable dilemma for her Muslim friend. Yeah, and just real quickly, I want uh, to uh, Christ for Christian, Christian for Christ. It's chapter three, verses three and four. Chapter three, verses three and four, not chapter three, verse forty-four. He was writing it down. Mm -hmm. I just want to correct that. Yeah, here's the dilemma. If Muhammad confirms the scriptures of the Jews and Christians, which they possessed at that time, as the incorruptible, pure revelations that God gave to the prophets, which he does, 
David gave you an avalanche of passages to prove that point. That means Muhammad is a false prophet and an antichrist. Why? Because he contradicts the core doctrines of those very scriptures which the Jews and Christians possess. So if he's telling the Jews and Christians, look, your scriptures that you have in your possession right now, right now, I confirm those to be the pure, preserved words of God. Well, a Christian could say, but my scriptures say Jesus is the God-man, God who became flesh, the eternal Son who died on the cross for my sins, and I have to confess him as my Lord and Savior to be saved. What say you? We know what Muhammad's message was. So now, Muhammad, you just put yourself in a situation which you can't come out of. You said my scripture is true. My scripture says that you're a fake, so I can't follow you. Mm -hmm. That's the dilemma. That's the dilemma, folks. All right. And again, Leah, if you want more on that, um, just just look it up. We have plenty of videos dealing with that topic. Um, here we have a question from Damien Thorne. Oh, wow. Damien Thorne? Are you kidding? That's a pseudonym, man. That's from The Omen. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's a movie Omen. Damien I think Thorne. I, I can't. Oh, yeah. He's actually got a picture of Damien. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> picture of Damien is his uh, little avatar there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So he says, I have a question. Yeah. In torture and crucifixion, the physical body suffered and sacrificed for the humanity. Is flesh our savior? So, um, what does that mean, man? I didn't get it. Well, well, he's saying is is uh, so so Jesus is is tortured and crucified, but it's not torturing and crucifying his divine nature. So, yeah, is yeah. it just the flesh that is our savior? Um, and yeah, uh, I'm, I'm supposing the I'm supposing the the general Christian response here is uh, no, it's it's the the God man who's suffering, right? It's the That's, God the God man course. who's suffering. Yeah, it's not the flesh; it's the person who suffers as flesh. So. To talk about the flesh suffering, uh, suffering, it's almost as if the person's detached from the flesh. No, it's the divine person who suffers in the flesh for our salvation. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer. So I don't say the flesh suffered or the divine nation, the nature suffered. The person suffered in the flesh for our redemption. So that person suffered. And, so and we don't uh, talk about the nature suffering. Person. Several ahead. several people are uh, are bringing up questions re related to. This. I guess it's because we're talking about the incarnation, and so they're sort of yeah. fast forwarding to the resurrection. But uh, in light of the meaning of the incarnation, so this is fine. But we have a, just a, a couple of questions after this. We have uh, a, a very similar one. Um, this yeah. is from Stefan, who says, "Who died on the cross? Jesus' physical body or okay. human nature? I think he means Jesus' physical body or." divine nature since he's trying to say either either or now we wouldn't say that the divine nature died in the sense of ceasing to exist but it was the god man there who yeah. who died so you want to go into a little more on that we wouldn't even say the human nature died because even human beings when they die they continue to exist that's mm -hmm. biblical teaching that's chronic teaching well, but in, the, in the sense of the heart stops and things like that yeah so physically you can say the organ shut down but the person continues to exist consciously as a disembodied soul slash spirit. Now, I know there's a debate. Is the soul different from the spirit? I'm not entering that debate. Christians, much smarter than I can imagine to be, disagree. Whatever your position is, when a person dies, he doesn't cease to exist in a different state. So Jesus, the God-man, died. So his physical body died, but his human soul slash spirit that's attached to his divine person continue to consciously exist so if you're asking was it jesus in respect to his human nature di who died or jesus in respect to his divine nature it's the god man that experienced death mm -hmm. that person who is god and man at the same time he that person experienced death without ceasing to exist that's a biblical teaching and just to give the verse to prove that jesus was still consciously alive john chapter 2 verses 19 and 22 where jesus says to the jews destroy this temple now they thought he's talking about the actual temple in jerusalem destroy this temple and i notice i will raise it up mm -hmm. in three days and then they responded it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up then john says but the temple that he was speaking about was his body so my question to those who think that death means secession of life how in the world could jesus raise his physical body animate his physical body attach his physical body to his divine person, his human soul slash spirit, if he wasn't consciously alive for those three days and still actively sustaining creation. Mm -hmm. 
So I hope that answered the question. I don't know. Yep. All right. And uh, we might have more along these lines since uh, those two came up sort of back to back from two different people. Um, Jaweed is a former Muslim. He said, I'm a former Muslim and I wouldn't believe God became flesh and I never understood it. Now, notice, if you never understood it, then I, I guess it would make sense if, if you say um, you, you wouldn't believe it. Um, now, there are senses in which we, we don't understand things. That doesn't mean they're not true. I mean, you might not understand how electricity works. That doesn't mean you, don't, you shouldn't believe that electricity works. Um, you might not understand various things from science. It doesn't mean that you, you don't believe those things. Um, but the, the, the general issue here with not believing that God uh, became, because he doesn't appear to be saying that he denies that God exists. He's objecting to the claim of the incarnation. And yeah. this usually comes down to one or one of two issues. Either God can't do it. He can't enter creation. He can't become flesh. Or two, even though he can, he just didn't. Uh, he didn't have a good reason to. So, Sam, how would, how would you respond to uh, the first claim um, that God couldn't enter creation? Yeah. Yeah, my, well, he's, he's no longer Muslim, so the Quran is not authoritative mm -hmm. for him, uh, because even the Quran doesn't deny that Allah can enter creation. He mm -hmm. does. The most famous passage would be chapter 27, 7 to 9. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to look at it for the benefit of others, David, that's up to you. It's a Quran, chapter 27, 7 to 9, where Allah speaks from the tree that was lit by a fire uh, to Moses, and he says, blessed is he who is in the tree. In it, and blessed is the one who's around it. So now who was in it? Allah. So mm -hmm. even from a Quranic perspective, the fact that Allah can enter his creation is a firm. And then when you take statement, and another one, by the way, one that many Christians should start using, but for some reason doesn't come up. Chapter 89, verses 21 to 23 of the Quran, David, and you know this, it says, Thy Lord, your Lord comes with the angels, rank upon rank, to the earth to judge. Mm -hmm. So Allah is going to show up one day to the earth, what is angels to judge mankind? That sure sounds like Allah is entering his creation, right? Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with the hadiths, such as Bukhari and Muslim, where it says that every third part of the night, Allah descends to the lowest part of the heaven and asks, who's praying to me so that I can forgive him? Now, how could Allah descend to the lowest part of the heavens, which would, if we're going upwards, would be the first heaven, because you go up, you ascend. He's going from above the seventh heaven, the throne, to the lowest heaven. And all of that is part of creation if Allah cannot enter creation. So, Quranically speaking, and even statements attributed to Muhammad, Allah does enter his creation, can enter his creation, and will enter his creation to judge mankind. Biblically speaking, we have the Bible teaching clearly Jesus is God in the flesh. So when he says God can't be flesh, according to who? Since he's not God, he's not omniscient, he's not a prophet, on what basis... What authority is appealing to to say that God can't do that? Mm -hmm. There are things God can't do, but that's not one of them. So mm -hmm. I would ask him, according to who? Since you're not God, you're not omniscient, how can you know what God cannot or can do apart from revelation? Mm -hmm. so. All right, so uh, following up on, on those lines, um, that both Christians and Muslims and Jews should agree that God as omnipotent, can enter creation if he wants. And we, we see God entering creation in uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Quran. So if, if that's your objection, Joe we, we would we would hope that you would explain why God can't do that. Um, but that leads it to what Sam just said, it, it, that the question would then be, if you, if you agree that God can do it, um, you would have to just say, well, well, he wouldn't do it. So then it would come down to a matter of, Revelation. So, Sam, why should we believe that God not only could do it, but actually did do it? Because of the historical Jesus. I mean, no one denies that Jesus walked this earth. Even a diehard enemy of the Christian faith, Bart Ehrman, confirms that there's one indisputable fact about Jesus, that he was killed on a cross. And as we look at the life of the historical Jesus, he made claims to show that he is not simply a mortal that walked this earth, but the unique divine son of God, who's fully God in essence. So if he claimed to be God, and then he died on the cross and was raised back to mortal life to prove it, here is your proof from these historical events that God did enter creation as a man, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. So that would entail a discussion of the historical evidence supporting Jesus' divine claims that he claimed to be the divine son of God, his death and resurrection. And 
you had a debate on that, didn't you? Um, on the resurrection? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I recommend people to check out your debate. Check out William Lane Craig's debate. Check out Mike Lacona's debate, Gary Habermas. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is simply overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. so and so that by the way, that that's that's why I'm a Christian right now. Right. Um, I, I used to be an atheist. You can go ahead and watch uh, if you go to YouTube and type in why I am a Christian. You can see my testimony there. But um, I grew up as an atheist. The reason I became a Christian is because I came to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And if you've got Jesus rising from the dead, this looks like something that's very important in Scripture. I mean, something that's very important in history. Right. Uh, this seems to be one of, at least one of the main events in history. So what's God doing here? Because people don't normally rise from the dead. So it seems like God is trying to do something there. And uh, two, it seems like God is putting his stamp of approval on this guy's message, right? Jesus' message. And so, and so then the, the question becomes, uh, what did Jesus teach? Because if whatever Jesus taught, it seems like he has God's stamp of approval through the miracles and through his own resurrection. And therefore, we should take what he said seriously. And one of the things that Jesus was claiming is that he is God in human flesh. And so that's why we would take the doctrine of the incarnation uh, very yeah. seriously, Joey. Yeah, and, and Dave, just two points real quickly. That See, Damon Thorne is here mocking and blaspheming. He says, can God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit become physical Take physical bodies and play Dallas Cowboys. So I, I, I figured. Oh no no, this, no 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 no! I'm gonna block him for that. Um, yeah yeah. I figured this guy was here to blaspheme and mock with that yeah, moniker, yeah. Thorn. And just real quickly, Hannah Rodriguez, you hit on it. Jesus is a two-natured person. This is called the hypostatic union. He possesses the nature of God and the possesses possesses the nature of of man. Two natures united in one person. Bam! I like the way she said it. Is Jesus a two-natured person in the Trinity? Yes, and he's the only one. That has two natures. Mm-hmm. Father has one nature. Spirit has one nature. Son has one nature that they share in common. But then the son took on additional nature, the nature of humanity. So he is a two-natured person. Excellent. I like the way mm-hmm. she worded it. All right. Um, next one here. Is modalism a heresy? Yes. Yeah. It and, is and we, we, we actually talked about that last time. Um, so we don't want to go through all of that again. Uh, Sam, just 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 remind, since uh, the Shepherd's Ambassador um, apparently wasn't there, um, just remind yeah. the viewers of that passage from John that we have. It's John 8, 17, 18, but you can read 16 to 19. That one for me seals the deal. I mean, the evidence that modalism is an unbiblical doctrine is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. But if you really want to just a quick, mm-hmm. quick refutation of modalism, John 8, 17, 18. You can read 16, 19, but it's, it's really 17 to 18. What does mm-hmm. Jesus say there? All right. So this is Jesus speaking. He says, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies. So so men here, he's talking about um, divine persons here in, in, a, uh, in the next verse, but uh, it's the same principle. You've got two witnesses. He says, even in your law, it was been it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself and the father who sent me testifies about me. So he's appealing to himself, the son one and the father as two distinct persons. Witnesses. Mm-hmm. And if modalism is true, that means Jesus either deceived the Jews because he's not a separate, distinct second witness from the Father, because he's simply the human manifestation of the Father, so it's one person in two modes testifying, or modalism is a heresy. But I do want to qualify, because there was a sister who lovingly, when I say chided me, she wasn't being rude, Mm -hmm. she's saying, I need to be careful, because there are many people who are ignorant of the Trinity, and maybe modalistic, because they're ignorant of the Trinity, are they going to hell? No, that's not what I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that if someone is ignorant of the Trinity doesn't know what the Trinity entails, and because he's confused or she's confused, may think along modalistic lines, that person is going to hell. What what I am saying is that teaching is a heresy, but there are some people who hold it in ignorance, but then there are those who champion it and say that the doctrine of the Trinity is a satanic doctrine. Those are different from those who are ignorant. So I want to be clear. I didn't want to miscommunicate, because after all, you have Trinitarians, David, that when they define the Trinity, they sound like modalists. Mm -hmm. Because they don't know. This is a doctrine you need to study. And unfortunately, many Christians do not study the doctrine of the Trinity. But by the grace of God, that's why we're here. You're here. Anthony's here. Edward Dalcor. 
we're here to educate our brothers and sisters on the core doctrines of the Christian faith so that they're able to get a grasp of it and correctly articulate it for the glory of God. All right, this is from Furious Wild Hawk. How did Christianity and the Trinity develop? What did Allah say in the Quran? Is Mary part of the Trinity? So we have three separate, uh, three separate issues there. Um, how did Christianity and the Trinity develop? I'm assuming you mean the doctrine of the Trinity, right? Not the Trinity, because the Trinity is the eternal nature uh, of God. Um, be a long question on how you say, how did Christianity and the Trinity develop? So if you want to talk about how Christianity developed, you mean like the entire history of Christianity? That would be, uh, that would be <laughs> kind of, that would be kind of rough. Uh, but, but it's, but, but, but Sam, um, uh, we, we, we can give the, the kind of gist there. As far as I understand it, um, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God had revealed that uh, there is some sort of plurality uh, within his nature. Then we get we start getting more details uh, with the incarnation of Jesus and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. That's where we learn. That's where we learn that Father, Son and Holy Spirit are all divine and we see this starting to become part of early christian worship this becomes part of christian worship but christians still had to formulate a doctrine that is immune to misunderstanding that's immune to um and any sort of uh, heretical interpretation and that fits all of the passages and yes. christians did did have to work on that for several centuries because keep in mind they're using human language human concepts but trying to describe the eternal nature of god and that is very very difficult to do to capture the nature of god in a short simple creed that that can't be misinterpreted so that's what that's what they struggled with right exactly they didn't struggle whether the bible taught there are three distinct eternal relationships that are fully God. What they struggled with was how to articulate that because the Bible does give us that revelation, but the apostles didn't go around giving us the precise technical theological vocabulary to articulate their relationships. So that took time and that's to be expected. Finite creatures trying to comprehend the infinite being of God. So that, and in fact, till this day, I mean, until this day you have solid, Christian theologians and philosophers who are still debating whether there is a subordination of some kind within the Godhead, even in eternity. So this is something we're going to continue to grow in, learn, debate, and disagree, because we're dealing with a being that's beyond our ability to fully comprehend mm -hmm. to this day. Right? So, yeah, yep. it's going to take time, and we're going to take all eternity to try to figure it out. All right, so um, that, that's that's the basic idea. If you want more detail than that, then that's going to be beyond the scope of uh, Q&A here. Um, but um, he goes on to say, what did Allah say in the Quran? So what is the Quran's view of the Trinity? Well, here's, here's my challenge to the Muslims who are listening. Show me a single passage in the entire Quran where it says there are disbelievers who say that Allah is the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. You'll never find it. You will never find in the Quran an accurate description, articulation of what the Trinity was at the time of Muhammad and a condemnation of it. What you find is the Quran either misrepresenting the belief of Christians or addressing some heretical groups that existed at that time mm -hmm. that <clears throat> vanished into thin air. In other words, you have the Quran saying in chapter 5, verse 73, they are disbelievers who say that Allah is the third of three. Now, if you continue reading 75, the other two are supposed to be Jesus and Mary. So if you read 573 to 75, and then you combine it with 5116, the third of three, Allah is the third of three. The other two is Jesus and Mary, which is explicitly stated in 5116, where Muhammad imagines a conversation that will take place between Jesus and Allah at the last day, where Allah is going to ask Jesus, Oh, Jesus, did you tell mankind to take you and your, your mother as two gods besides Allah? Now, for the life of me, I do not know who these individuals were that believe that Allah is the third of three and that Jesus and Mary are the other two gods because we don't have any data telling us that there was a group at the time of Muhammad that actually believed that. I know Muslims will appeal to earlier centuries, like the fourth century, to the Coloridians, the Maryamites, but that was in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. The Quran is supposedly 
7th century, right? 600s. So who is Muhammad addressing? Who is he condemning? And even if he's condemning a heretical group, by saying that he's not addressing the Trinity, but some heretical belief by some particular group at that time, you're basically admitting that the Quran nowhere condemns the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, and, and Simpl- ju- yeah, ju- yeah. Ju- just just to understand the point here, right? Orthodox Christians would also condemn these heretical groups, right? So, so, yeah. so, so we could read, we could, we could read some of these Quran verses that are going after, and I. I, I personally don't think he's addressing any actual heretical group at all. I think Muhammad heard Christians saying um, Trinity, God is three, and he heard them saying that Jesus is the son and that Mary is the mother of Jesus and assumed, he simply assumed that the doctrine of the Trinity is, is father, mother, and son because of his yeah. ignorance. In, in other words, um, if the Quran is from Allah, I would expect Allah to actually respond to Christian doctrine because Allah clearly in the Quran thinks that he's addressing Christian doctrine. And what he's addressing shouldn't be limited to some group that no one has ever heard of. This is Allah's eternal word. It's his eternal speech. It's not limited to the 7th century. So we would expect Allah to address mainstream Orthodox Christian doctrine. He never does. Um, on the other hand, alternatively, if the Quran is not actually the word of God, if it is the word of a 7th century caravan trader, well, I understand completely a 7th century caravan trader misunderstanding Christian doctrine and not understanding what we're actually talking about and then adding it into his scriptures. And let me add another point about another statement the Quran says that Muslims use to try to say the Quran denies that Jesus is God. Mm-hmm. In chapter 5 or 17, chapter 5 or 72, you'll find it stated, there are disbelievers who say Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. Mm-hmm. Number one, <clears throat> From the Quranic perspective, and Christians, you have to hear this because this is a passage that fails to address what we believe about Christ being God incarnate. It sounds like it's attacking the deity of Christ. Actually, it's not. It's actually attacking modalism, (laughs) even though that's not its purpose. Like David said, Muhammad is misunderstanding Christian doctrine. So in his critique of Christianity, he's misrepresenting it. What do I mean? Ask a Muslim, who is the Allah of the Quran? They'll tell you, well, besides him being the creator of heaven and earth, he's the one who sent the prophets. He's the one who sent Jesus. According to biblical theology, biblical teaching, the one who sent Jesus is the Father. So to say that Allah is the Messiah is simply another way of saying that the Father is the Messiah, which we do not believe. Because if Allah is the one who sent Jesus, that's supposed to correspond to the Father of Christ in the New Testament. Because according to New Testament, it's God the Father who sent Jesus. To therefore say that Allah is the Messiah is equivalent to saying God the Father is the Messiah, which no Trinitarian believes. So who is he actually refuting? I mm-hmm. still want to know. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. We have a question from uh, Nelson here who writes, Is there a connection between God ordering the sacrifice of Isaac and the sacrifice of Jesus? Definitely. Now, I don't know how much time you want me to take on this, but... We're, I'm, I'm sure we'll be because we, we were focusing on the deity of Christ, but uh, yeah. th- these are all kind of kind of connected. This one's kind of loosely connected. So if you yeah. want to give a brief answer here, uh, but I'm sure we'll be spending more time on uh, on some of these issues in future live yeah. live streams. I, I think maybe in another session we'll talk about where do we find in the Hebrew scriptures a prophecy of Messiah will be raised on the third day. And that will give us time to then unpack Genesis 22. With greater depth, because the Lord does say in Luke twenty four forty six, and Paul also agrees, which he has to because he's speaking by the Spirit of Christ in First Corinthians fifteen four, that the Hebrew Bible prophesied Messiah would be raised on the third day, and one of those prophecies has to do with Abraham and the binding of Isaac. So, real quickly, if you read Genesis chapter twenty two verse one or two, I'm going to do it real quick, guys. I'm speaking fast because we want to talk about the incarnation, though this is loosely connected. In Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, note the point of similarity between Isaac and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Isaac said to be Abraham's only begotten son. In the Hebrew, it's Yachid, only son whom he loves. Mm -hmm. New Testament, Jesus is God's one and only son, his only begotten son whom he loves. Interestingly, the Greek word that John uses to denote Jesus' unique relationship to the Father is monogenes. Monogenes, only begotten. John 1.14, John 1.18, write these down, guys, I'm going fast. John 1.14, John 1.18, John 3.16, John 3.18, and 1 John 4.9. Those passages, Jesus is called monogenes. 
Isaac is called monogenes in Hebrews 11, 17, uh, Hebrews 11, 17. So here's that similarity. Isaac, Jesus, their father's only begotten beloved son. Another point of similarity. Isaac carried the wood that would be used to pretty much sacrifice him. If you go to Genesis 22 and you read verse 6, it says Isaac carried the wood. John 19, verse 17, Jesus carried the wood, the instrument of his crucifixion, the cross. That's another similarity. It says that Abraham arrived at his destination, which is one of the mountains in Moriah, on the third day. Genesis 22, 4, on the third day. And that was the day that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. And so in a sense, and this is how Hebrews 11, 17 to 19 reasons, Abraham thought Isaac was as good as dead, but he trusted God to bring back Isaac to him to keep his promise concerning Isaac. So he assumed that God would raise him back to life. And Hebrew says he did receive him back from the dead, figuratively speaking. But notice what day he received him back from the dead. The third day. What day did God the Father receive his only begotten son, his beloved, back from the dead? The third day. So anyway, for the sake of time, I'll stop there. But Lord willing, in a future session, we'll go really in-depth on Genesis 22. It's mind-boggling and other examples that point to a third-day resurrection of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, first and last points out, and this is totally off topic, but relevant to all topics that we discuss here. First and last said, uh, if you're being blessed, please support Sam and David by donating to them if you feel the Lord has put it on your heart. I just want to emphasize uh, helping out Sam if you can, because... Um, Thank you. Sam already has stuff to do. Uh, he has daughters to take care of. Uh, I'm the one who asked him, hey, could you start jumping on here on live streams? Because I believe that, that Sam is the best there is at answering uh, questions from Muslims. And so wanted him to come on here. But it is kind of a it is kind of a dirtbag move on my part. If I say, Sam, set out all this time out of your schedule and keep joining me on evenings and uh and just keep answering questions on on my channel uh so it'd be kind of a dirtbag move if i just start taking up a lot of his time and having him on here more and more and more um so if uh people can help him out by donating to his ministry and uh, uh supporting him on patreon now sam has uh a paypal um, page let me go ahead and uh, click on it here first and last thank you for putting that up earlier um but uh, so he has a, a, a PayPal link there uh, yeah. and that's over. That's over in the comment section. I also put a link to Sam's Patreon page. It's in the description box. So very easy. Now, now, on a side note, I know that some people have issues with Patreon. I'm one of the people who have issues with Patreon because they have started blocking people for saying certain things. I'm of the position that they shouldn't be blocking people unless the people are, are carrying out some sort of illegal activity or something like that. Um, they haven't been blocking us. They haven't been blocking Christian apologists and so on, but they are blocking people that we don't think should be blocked. People for, uh, block being blocked for their ideas or for their speech. So um, that, that, that could become more and more of an issue the more people that Patreon blocks. Uh, but people all are, are working on alternatives to Patreon because it is a, it is a good platform apart from them uh, starting to turn in a more social justice warrior uh, uh, direction. Uh, it is an amazing platform. It allows fans who want to see people do more of something to then fund them to go ahead and do it. And it's crowdfunding. So people uh, aren't funding everything they're doing. It's a bunch of people. If you have a bunch of people who want you to keep doing what you're doing, they can make it easier for you to do that by saying, hey, well, a bunch of us will kick in five bucks per month. And that adds up so that it compensates the person for his time, as I'd like Sam to be uh, compensated for any uh, time will be taken up. Uh, getting them on the channel. Now, just to be clear, I, I'm absolutely positive Sam would not hesitate to do it for free and to come on here all the time. Yeah. He loves to talk about these things. But again, I know that I'm taking away him away from other things that he would be working on, other ministry projects that he would be working on. He would be working on articles or something like that. So I'm actually taking him away from other work to have him on here. So those of you who can, very simple to uh, go down to the link in the description box, um, clip, Click on uh, his Patreon page. Again, we might need to look into an alternative to Patreon if they continue blocking people. Uh, Patreon has been such a cool platform over the past few years that um, I I'm hoping they don't destroy themselves. I'm hoping they actually turn it around, apologize to the people they blocked, invite them back on the platforms, whether the people come back or not, um, acknowledge their wrongs. Um, uh, I'm hoping that. But in the meantime, in the meantime, um, 
go ahead and, and support Sam there if you can. Sign up for five bucks or ten bucks or two bucks or whatever you can. That will uh, help him out. And if we need to migrate to another platform, we'll be doing that in a couple months because, again, people are working on more uh, uh, other platforms. All right, now, Sam, we had a. Uh, I'll have to scroll down to it. I have it right here. Um, in order to actually post it on the screen, I have to. Um, I would have to scroll way down because, uh, just so everyone knows, I have two things. I have the the sort of chat as it's coming up down here, and I have uh, this the the chat as it appears in this program that I'm using, where it's being fed into it, so I can post them on the screen if I want. Um, but I'm way behind up here. I'm still pretty pretty close towards the towards the. Uh, the first third of the live chat here. Um, but I wanted to address this one down here from Chris Adam, uh, who is apparently a Muslim because he's um, citing Muslim channels. But Chris Adam said, I found a good channel called Truth Shall Prevail. It refutes many of Wood's false claims on Islam. One of them that God supposedly appeared to Moses in a bush claim. Now, Sam, you just mentioned that uh, earlier, yeah. but notice he's he's calling that a false claim. He's saying it's false that God appeared to Moses in a bush in Islam. Now, do, yeah. do you want to go to you want to go to should we go to Surah, Surah 27 to address this? You, listen, the Quran says it is a perspicuous book, a clear book that provides a fully detailed explanation of its passages. So if. They refuted you. That means they refuted Muhammad. Yep. Chapter 27, verses 7 to 9. If you can just, just read chapter 27, verses 7 to 9. And you unpack it, David. Now, remember, he just said, remember, this YouTube channel refutes David Wood's distortions of the Quran. David is simply quoting the Quran. That means they're refuting Muhammad and Allah. Because obviously, Allah and Muhammad weren't able to communicate more effectively, misleading us into thinking that Allah was actually in a tree. Read that from so mm -hmm. they can see. All right, so uh, we'll read Yusuf Ali here. And Yusuf Ali, we'd have to actually get the footnote where he tries to cover this up. Um, but behold, Moses said to his family, I perceive a fire. So Moses, Christians will be familiar with the story of the burning bush. This is Muhammad's version of the burning bush story. Behold, Moses said to his family, I perceive a fire. Soon will I bring you from there some information, or I will bring you a burning brand to light our fuel that you may warm yourselves. But when he came to the fire, a voice was heard, blessed are, notice here, blessed are those in the fire and those around, and glory to God, the Lord of the worlds. Now, what's wrong with that translation, Sam? It's not plural, it's singular. Yeah, so it's blessed what? is he who is in the fire. Yep. Okay, so, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, uh, if, you ha if you're using a Yusuf Ali uh, Quran, go ahead and look that up because Yusuf Ali admits this in his comments on that, right? So he includes a footnote. Oh, by the way, it's not really those, it's he. Okay. So uh, when yeah, he yeah. came to the fire, a voice was heard, blessed is he who is in the fire and those around and glory to God, the Lord of the worlds. O oh, Moses, verily, I am God, the exalted and might the wise. So, Sam, I, I don't the know. The tree is saying uh, I'm God, huh? Yeah? The yeah. tree is saying I am God. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so uh, notice what we have here. The voice in the fire says, Blessed is he who is in the fire, and those around, or he who, he, he who is outside of the fire. Um, yeah. But, Sam, who, who is in the fire here? And this would be if, if our Muslim yeah. friend, yeah. if our Muslim friend, uh, Chris here is saying that this is not referring to Allah who's in the fire. And Allah speaking out of the fire says, blessed is he who is in the fire. And then says, verily, I am Allah, the exalted and might, the wise. Yes. Sam, yes. if we're wrong, if we're misinterpreting this, if this is not God speaking out of the fire, uh, yes. wouldn't we have to say that the Quran is just hopelessly unclear and therefore that the Quran verses that t repeatedly talk about Allah's word being clear are just false and that the Quran is a false book for misleading people? Yes. yes. Let me just mention three passages they can note down. We don't look at them. I mean, there are dozens, but write down chapter 6, verse 114 of the Quran. Uh, write down chapter 16, verse 89, and then chapter 41, verse 3, all of which say that this Quran is not clear plain Arabic so people with understanding can understand, comprehend its message, and that it's a book that fully expounds its verses. So that if he's now telling me the plain reading 
of this text, isn't that Allah is in the fire in the tree? Then that means instead of being clear Arabic, it's a book of confusion that has misled people like David and myself into assuming that by golly, Allah was there speaking from the tree, from the fire. And let me just give another passage to confirm this. I'll read it if you, if you don't mind, David. It's chapter 28, 29 to 30. Because if he wants to tap dance around this one, well, here, 28, 29 to 30. And I'm going to read Hilali Khan, chapter 28, 29 to 30. Then when Musa, Moses, had fulfilled the term and was traveling with his family, he saw a fire in the direction of Tur. He said to his family, wait, I have seen a fire. Perhaps I may bring to you from there some information or a burning firebrand that you may warm yourselves. Now watch it. So when he reached it, and they put in parentheses the fire, he was called from the right side of the valley in the blessed place from the tree, David, called from the tree, O Musa, verily I am Allah, uh, Rabbul Alameen. He was called from the tree, and the voice said, O Musa, I am Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of all the worlds. The plain reading of these passages, Allah was there in some sense, in that tree, in that fire. Now, if you want to say it's Jibreel, then that means Gabriel just claimed to be Muhammad's Lord, Allah, the Lord of all creation. So, up to you, Muslim. So, yep, uh, if you're saying that Gabriel is Allah, <laughs> you, you might as well. You guys keep calling, you keep calling Muhammad Allah and the, and the various things you do and the various things you say, and you keep calling him the God of the Bible and the, the, the passages you quote. Um, so, wh why not? Why not deify Gabriel as well? Yeah, yeah, what's left? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> All right, this is from Hannah. She says, did God have an incarnation or God-man nature before the official incarnation since oh, God is seen in human form or as a messenger in the Old Testament like with Abraham? Beautiful question because oftentimes when we do talk about God appearing as a man in the Old Testament, some people get confused and assume that means God is becoming flesh. It's going to be a little not technical, maybe a little hard to understand what I'm saying, because, again, we're dealing with God's actions and his actions, as Isaiah 55, by the way, states. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, he says, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways and thoughts are higher than ours, just like the heavens are higher than the earth. <clears throat> what you have in the Old Testament is God appearing in the form of a man without actually becoming a flesh and blood human being. We would call that a theophany or a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in a visible form without him actually taking on the nature and becoming that very thing, right? Incarnation is different. It's not simply Jesus appearing as a man when he was born from his blessed mother. That's true. Being born as a man, that means he had the appearance of a man. But he actually became a man at that moment when he was conceived in the womb of his blessed mother by the power of the Holy Spirit and then added an additional nature that's now bound to his divine person forever and ever. That's not what's taking place in the Old Testament. God could appear in various forms. He could appear as a man. He could appear in a pillar of a cloud. He could appear as a being that just radiates like a rainbow. The Holy Spirit could appear as a dove. But they didn't become any of those things by nature. They didn't take on the nature of those things. So it's not an incarnation in which they become the very thing which form they assume. It's simply a manifestation. That's all it is. It's like when angels appear as human beings. They're not human beings. They don't have a human nature. They don't have human physical bodies, but they are created in such a way where they can assume the form of a human being without actually taking on an additional nature becoming flesh. Now, I hope that made some sense. So the difference is, in the Old Testament, God can appear in visible form as a man without actually becoming flesh and taking on an additional nature, which is different to what Jesus did at the Incarnation. He didn't simply appear as a man. He became a human being in every sense of the term with the exception of sin. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if that was clear. Mm -hmm. All right. Maryam R. says, uh, Muslims say the comforter is Muhammad. So this goes, this is going back to the, the topic we just uh, were talking about earlier. Mo Muslims say the comforter is Muhammad. How do we show them that the comforter is actually the Holy Spirit? And how do we show the Muslims that Allah is actually Satan? Uh, Sam, how, I, I would say just actually read the passage, right? Read 14. Read, uh, read, read the passage. Read, read John chapters 14 to 16 and, yep. 
without without someone like Zucker Nike standing over your shoulder, picking and choosing what he points to and saying, you see, this is this is Muhammad. You'd have to conclude that this is talking about the Holy Spirit because that's exactly what it says. So, Sam, uh, what would they find if they actually read this in context? Yeah. And the passages are John 14 verses 16 to 17. John 14, 26. So note these guys and read them. John 14, 26. John 15, 26. And then you have John 16, 7, all the way to 15. John 16, 7 to 15. John 14, 26 tells you, it says, but the comforter. Now, other translations will say helper, counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Right there, you're told it's the Holy Spirit. Now, according to Islamic theology, the Holy Spirit is Gabriel, even though the Quran doesn't teach that Gabriel's the Holy Spirit. But be that as it may, the Muslims can't have their cake or eat it too. And eat it too, I should say. If the Holy Spirit is Gabriel, then here Jesus is announcing the coming of Gabriel, not Muhammad. Unless you believe Muhammad is Gabriel in the flesh, Gabriel incarnate. So right off the bat, you have a problem with Islamic theology. They teach the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. But here they're telling us the counselor slash comforter who is the Holy Spirit is Muhammad. So either Gabriel is the man Muhammad, so Muhammad is the enfleshment of Gabriel, or Muslims are quite desperate to point to this passage. Now, beyond that, here's the problem with citing these statements as prophecies of Muhammad. Number one, it says the Father and the Son, read those passages for confirmation, the Father and the Son together send the Holy Spirit on behalf of Christ, for the sake of Christ, because of the authority of Christ, to glorify Christ. That's what it says. He will glorify me, John 16, 14 and 15. He will take what is mine and make it known to you. All that the Father has is mine. So the Holy Spirit sent by the Father and the Son for the sake of the Son, on behalf of the Son, to glorify the Son. Wait, hold on. Islamic theology says Allah is not the Father and Jesus is not the Son. Okay, well, if Muhammad is the comforter, the Holy Spirit, then that means two things. And here's the, here's the point. Muhammad would have gone around preaching that the Allah who sent him must have been the Father and the Son. Why? Because Jesus says the Father and I, the Son, will send the comforter. Islamic theology says Allah sent Muhammad. If the comforter is Muhammad and Allah sent Muhammad, and yet Jesus says the Father and the Son send the comforter, Muslims, you just end up proving Allah is a binatarian being. Allah is the Father and the Son because they are the God that sent Muhammad, who's the comforter. Which means the second point. The Quran must have been corrupted after the time of Muhammad because there's no way that Muhammad would have denied that Allah is the Father and Jesus is the Son. And yet there are passages in the Quran where it says Allah is not the Father, Jesus is not a Son. So Muslims, you ended up proving too much. You prove that Allah... Is father and son, the God of Muhammad, and the Quran was corrupted after Muhammad. Now, are you ready now to worship Jesus as your Allah and the Father as one with him, so that the Father and Son are your Allah? So, <clears throat> and Masihu Akbar, the Messiah is greater. You're up to you. Amen. All right, now, Sam, uh, check this out. Chris, Chris Adam here again, our, our Muslim friend. He goes back to the issue that we already addressed. Uh, the claim that Allah appeared to Moses in a bush is a lie. There's a YouTube channel called Truth Shall Prevail. It refutes wood on the bush claim. Now, there are lots of things here. Uh, one, I tend to find that anytime any Muslim says anything in response to anything we say, even if what, even if the response is completely ridiculous, Muslims will say, aha, this person destroyed you. Ah, oh, this channel completely refutes you, right? Do, do you find that? That as long as someone's, as long as a yep. Muslim apologist says anything in response to anything we said, whether yes. even if it's completely false, according to Muslim sources, they just don't care. They'll say, aha, decisive refutation. Is that your experience? Well, the, the greatest proof of what you said is your debate with Muhammad Ajab. If anyone honestly, sincerely watches a debate, you school them, pul pulverize them in the nicest, sweetest, Christ-like manner. And yet, did you see the uproar when... Muhammad Hijab comes up and says, see, I knew I'd have to give you a free Arabic lesson. Allah doesn't salah to, the, to Muhammad. For Muhammad, I got you, David. And yet, your entire argument was, Allah, salah, prays 
before Muhammad, not to Muhammad, and yet till this day, they thought his response was an annihilation of your argument. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. I still I still get comments from Muslims. Ha, 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 ha. Muhammad Hijab schooled you. I go, oh, yeah, how, how did you do it? Ha, ah, he, he showed you that you're ignorant. You don't know the Arabic. And it's it's four, not two. I go, guys, that's exactly what I said. You keep telling me. And they say, no, you did say two. I go, where? Where did I say two? You said Oh, yeah. Who does Allah pray to? I say, yes, I know because we said that he prays. I asked who he prays to. But when I'm talking about what the Quran says, I said, praise for Muhammad. No, you said two. And they just don't, they just don't get it. Anyway. They don't care. They don't care. Yeah. Anyway. So that's the, what you said. Yeah, that's that, that is an, that is an ongoing problem. Um, when, when I say that a Christian apologist has refuted a Muslim apologist, I mean that he's gone through the argument and he's shown that the argument fails. I don't mean he said some random thing often ridiculous in response to it, and I'm just going to call it a refutation. Uh, but notice, he said, the claim that Allah appeared to Moses in a bush is a lie. Well, we granted that it could be a lie. What we're saying is, if it's false, if Allah didn't appear to Moses in a bush, then the Quran is completely confusing, because it says that Moses sees the bush yep. burning, he goes, he hears a voice, blessed is he who is in the fire, and then the voice speaks and says, I am Allah. So, the voice says, the voice, which is the voice of Allah, says, blessed is he who is in the fire. Who is this? Who in the world is this talking about here? If it's talking about someone other than Allah, it's completely misleading and confusing, which would then refute the Quran's repeated claims to be clear, to be fully okay, explained. Don't, don't forget, it says the voice here, 2830, mm -hmm. from the tree. It's right there, 2830, from the tree. Oh, Moses, verily, I am Allah. The what voice, wait, wait, wait. So it's the voice from the tree. Yes. Oh, Moses. And, and this is, this is Allah speaking. I am Allah. Okay. But, the but, Lord, but I it's, mean. but it's a lie to say that Allah was speaking from the bush or the tree. Well, that was What's wrong with you, man? Yeah, that's your so, yeah. <laughs> so if it's a lie, then it's Allah who's lying. And, uh, my Muslim friends, uh, the Quran is just not the word of Allah. But I did want to point out that Notice what's what's the relevance of of Chris saying this? Uh, it just seems he wants to think that you 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 just can't see Allah or Allah can't appear can't appear to us and so on. Yeah. If that's his actual position, then he's got a he doesn't just have a problem with us. He has a problem with his own prophet, and he has just admitted that Muhammad was a false prophet. Let me go ahead and uh, read you a little bit from Sahih al-Bukhari, number seventy four thirty nine. This passage talking about the shin. This is a very long passage, but let me just read the beginning here. Narrated Abu Sa'id al-Qudri. We said, O oh, Allah's Messenger. So they're coming to Muhammad. They're coming to Muhammad to learn more about Allah. We said, O oh, Allah's Messenger, shall we see our Lord on the day of resurrection? So we, are we actually going to see Allah? Are we going to see him? So notice, this this would be more clear than the burning bush, right? I mean, all Moses sees is a burning bush, but Allah lets him know, hey, I'm actually the one in the bush, because that's what he says. Here they're talking about, are we actually going to see? Are we actually going to see Allah? So they asked Muhammad, shall we see our Lord on the day of resurrection? He said, do you have any difficulty in seeing the sun and the moon when the sky is clear? We said, no. He said, so you will have no difficulty in seeing your Lord on that day, as you have no difficulty in seeing the sun and the moon in a clear sky. So, Sam, I mean, we can actually see the sun and the moon. It'll burn your eyes a little yes. bit to, to see the sun. You don't have it, you don't have any such problem seeing the moon. And Muhammad is saying you're going to see Allah in exactly the same way. So, will Muslims be able to see Allah? You're a liar. Go to the YouTube channel, Truth <laughs> Prevails. You're a liar, David. Yeah. That doesn't mean that. What are you talking about? Yeah, so <laughs> we'll never see Allah. We'll never, ever see him. You're a liar for quoting our prophet, for for quoting our God. Very interesting uh, uh, theology. Let me scroll down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because um, Muhammad continues his discourse and uh, starts talking about how Allah is going to appear in different forms to different people. But then... Uh, then it will be said to them, do you know any sign by which you can recognize him? So Allah is appearing in all kinds of different forms. But do you Muslims know any form by which you can know Allah, that you can recognize Allah by? They will say the shin 
And so Allah will then uncover his shin, whereupon every believer will prostrate before him, and there will remain those who used to prostrate before him just for showing off and for gaining good reputation. So here, Muhammad says, you're going to see him just like you can see the moon. You're going to see him just like you can see the moon. But he might appear to you in different forms. Now notice, apparently he can't take the form of a fire. He can't take the form, because Chris says, Chris Adams says, that no, Allah can't do that. Allah can't do that. So I don't know what kind of God they're dealing with, right? So hold on. Allah can appear in a bunch of different forms, and he can lift up his garments. He can lift up his garment and say, look, here's my shin. Here it is right here. Now you recognize me, don't you? Allah can do that, but he can't appear to Moses in a fire. He can't do that, right? But even though he can't appear in a fire, he starts making a voice appear out of the fire saying, oh, I'm Allah. I'm Allah. Hey, everyone, I'm Allah. <laughs> this is do you, do you guys see this do you guys see this this, this is what muslims are pointing to the channels that 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 argue this this is just yeah. interesting stuff here truth prevails david you're a liar go to that channel yeah go to you're that <laughs> and it's pray for david not to yeah, okay buddy. all right so everyone allah just so you know allah prays for muhammad not to muhammad everyone everyone keep that in mind all right, Sam, we actually have several Muslims over here in the chat. I'm going to uh, present a, a more serious one here. Aladin says, Sam, Jewish rabbis said the Tanakh in Hebrew scripture never spoke about Jesus. And Christians enforce your wrong interpretation to the Tanakh on the Jew to prove your Trinitarian faith like you do with the Quran. Now, as a little... As a little side note here, we always bring up consistency. And, and the reason we do this is m most of the Muslims who show up have no concept of consistency. It never crosses their minds to say, how would my objection turn on my own religion if I used the exact same objection? So notice, Aladdin here is appealing to Jewish rabbis and their interpretation, their understanding of Scripture and saying, well, if, if, if you don't agree with them, if they don't agree with you, then you must be wrong. So, Sam, how many Jewish rabbis would say that the Tanakh supports Islam and supports the belief that Muhammad is the final messenger of Allah? Nada. None? Zero. But wait Nada. a minute. Wait a minute. Allah Dean says if, if a Jewish rabbi says that your revelation doesn't line up with his, then yes. you you have to abandon your you have to abandon your view. So wouldn't that be in a fact, problem for them? I, in fact, I challenge Aladdin to quote Tobias Singer, any of the rabbis, to show that the Tanakh prophesied a an Ishmaelite Arab prophet who comes after the Messiah <clears throat> and will perfect the religion of the patriarchs that came before this. Arabian prophet because understand the problem of Muhammad saying that Jesus is the Messiah number one the Jews believe when the Messiah comes it's it it's over there isn't a prophet who comes after him to perfect and complete the religion of Abraham because the Messiah is the culmination of all the prophecies so now notice the dilemma here David if you appeal to the rabbis the very fact Muhammad said Jesus is Messiah means that Muhammad cannot be a prophet because if Jesus is the Messiah there's no role for Muhammad and if the rabbis accept what Muhammad says, that Jesus is the Messiah, they got to reject Muhammad. So thank you, Muhammad, for pointing the rabbis back to Jesus Messiah, which means if they accept him as Messiah, they reject Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And I want to further challenge Aladdin to quote a, a rabbinic authority that says that Jesus will be born of the virgin, that Jesus will announce the coming of a prophet named Ahmed, that Jesus would be taken into heaven. When I say Jesus, I meant the Messiah. Let me correct myself. That the Messiah, because again, to me, Messiah is Jesus, Jesus is Messiah. So let me repeat it again. Show me a rabbi that says when the Messiah comes, he'll be born of a virgin. When Messiah comes, he'll be taken into heaven <clears throat> physically. And then will return physically and usher in Islam universally, die and be buried and be raised with the prophet that the Messiah would announce would come after him. Show me any rabbi who says any of those things that the Quran says about the Messiah, who is Jesus. If you're going to appeal to the rabbis, you just not only prove Jesus is not the Messiah, you prove Muhammad is not a prophet. The Quran is wrong because pretty much none of those rabbis believe Messiah will be born of a virgin. You believe Jesus is the Messiah born of a virgin. And no rabbi would say that the Messiah would announce the coming of a prophet named Ahmed after him, be taken to heaven, return to heaven, kill 
all the swine, destroy all the crosses, abolish jizya, and die and be buried. Show me any rabbi who taught anything remotely similar to what Muhammad taught about the Messiah, who happens to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a, I mean, as a general rule, n notice what we have here, right? Now, Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, but tons of Jews, tons of Jews believe that Jesus is the Messiah, believe yes. in the triune God of Scripture. Isn't this correct? Yes. Right. Yeah, the most famous is Michael Brown. Yeah. Yeah. So, great, great scholar. So, so, so notice what we have here, right? Um, but once you, uh, once you as a Jew recognize Jesus as the Messiah, you would refer to yourself as some sort of more specific term rather than just Jew. You would call yourself a Messianic Jew or, or a Christian or something like that. So notice, whenever a, a Jew believes in Jesus, uh, Muslims then put him into a different category and they say, ah, look at the Jews. Look, Jews reject Jesus. But keep in mind, they don't, they're not just rejecting the doctrine of the Trinity. They're rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. And you're saying, make these guys our authority for our understanding yeah. of Scripture. Well, you're telling us that we have to reject Jesus as the Messiah. We have to regard him as a false preacher, a false teacher, a false prophet. That's what you're telling us, right? And notice, everyone. Do you see how desperate these guys are, right? They don't, they're so desperate to attack Christianity, they don't even care that they're destroying Islam in the process. They just don't care, right? This is the spirit of this religion. Sam, are we justified in saying that this is an antichrist religion? The most wicked, deceptive, inconsistent, murderous cult known to mankind as Islam. I'm sorry, but man, I, I don't know how to say it any other way. All right. All right, now we have uh we have more from <laughs> we have more from Aladdin. I don't know why we keep interacting with him. I mean, we just uh the, the reason we keep interacting with him and we keep interacting with some of the Muslims here who uh clearly clearly are very horribly informed about their own religion and yeah. they basically watch some videos from apologists not realizing how weak the arguments of their Muslim apologists really are and how they can't possibly stand up to scrutiny. So they think they've mastered the topic when they clearly haven't thought through these things. So they'll go and watch a video. Ah, a, a Jewish rabbi says, the Bible doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity. And they'll go, oh, that's great. That's a great point to use on these Christians. Ha ha, this Jewish rabbi says, well, that Jewish yeah. rabbi also says Jesus isn't the Messiah. According to scripture, he also says that. Do you believe him? No, we don't believe him on that. Oh, okay. So he's not an authority? No, he's not an authority. Oh, and, and they, they don't even see it. And so this is the problem. The reason we keep interacting with them is we do see sometimes that over a period of time, over seeing that they're wrong over and over and over again, after seeing their own apologists exposed over and over and over again, some of them eventually get the point. Some of them eventually get the point and realize, wow. I keep hearing these arguments from my Muslim apologist heroes, and I keep bringing them over here, and then Sam just completely obliterates them like it's nothing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they see that. It takes a while. It takes a while. Because keep in mind, if, you're, if you've got Islam ingrained into you from the time you're born, and you're told all of these things all your life, and you've, you've grown up swimming in a sea of nonsense by Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didat, you think, oh, Islam has all the answers. And it can take a while. It can take a while to see the problem here. So, Aladdin. Oh, by the back. way, Dave, real quick. Oh, go ahead. Let me just look at the inconsistency of this other Muslim, Ashraf. I guess what we said fell on deaf ears. He goes, yeah, Muhammad is prophet in Isaiah 42, 8 to 14. Someone from Kedar. I guess he didn't get the argument. Anyone can quote any Old Testament text to say it's a prophecy of their respective leader, religious mm -hmm. leader. The argument was, your, your fellow Muhammadan said, no rabbi would accept our interpretation of these Old Testament texts as pointing to Jesus. So I'm going to challenge Ashraf and Aladdin. Quote one rabbinic authority that says Isaiah 42 is about an Arabian prophet from the progeny of Kedar, which begs the question because the Muslim sources do not know whether Muhammad is a Kedarite from Kedar or Neboeth, the other son of Ishmael. Mm -hmm. Talk about inconsistency, because we and, can. And, and, and by the way, if you if you if if you read the passage about Kedar. There's nothing there about this oh, probably, yeah. this having anything to do with the prophet, right? He basically, no. he basically he, Kedar was basically 
uh, if you're in the land of Israel, that's the people out east. And then you had the people, you know, out, out west. And he says, hey, everyone praise God. Everyone praise God. Not just the people of Israel. Everyone out there praise God. Everyone that way praise God. Everyone who's up high in the hills praise God. Everyone who's down low at the seashore praise God. He tells everyone to say, uh, to praise Yahweh. And the Muslims say, oh, it mentions Kedar. It mentions yeah. Kedar Steven. right here. This must yeah. be Muhammad. It's, I mean, guys, I mean, think about this. <laughs> When we talk about prophecies about Jesus, you get into some amazingly specific details in the Old Testament. What do your apologists do? Anything, anytime it mentions anything anywhere in all of Arabia, which was a huge place, anytime the Bible mentions anything, you say, oh, this is talking about a prophet. Read the passage for us. Read the passage for us. Show us where this says one word about a prophet coming from Kedar or something like that. Show us one word. Yeah, and I, I will about... bow down and recite the Shahada. You show me where the passage actually says that. Now, David, forget about the fact that Isaiah 53 talks about the servant dying vicariously for the sins of mankind to mm -hmm. reconcile them to God. Forget about the fact that Isaiah 9, 6 to 7 says a child will be born who's the mighty God who reigns on David's throne forever. That, and by forget the, about this is the same yeah. book they're quoting, right? This is the same book yeah. they're going to to affirm Islam, right? Yes, that's okay. right. So here Isaiah 42 talks about Muhammad, yet the same Isaiah says a child will be born who is the mighty God. Same Isaiah says that the servant of God in Isaiah 53 will die for the sins of Israel and the nations, and God will then honor him by exalting him to his status in heaven. And the same Isaiah that says Yahovah, Jehovah, is the father of Israel, all of which this prophet from Kedar denies. So now you got a schizophrenic prophet. Mm -hmm. He's prophesying a prophet who's going to contradict what that same prophet said, that God is our Father, this servant who's coming is going to die for our sins, and a child will be born as the mighty God, all of which is contradicted by this prophet of Kedar that that same prophet announced will come. Yeah, we got a schizophrenic prophet here. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, guys, just, just I mean, for those of you with, with, with ears to hear and eyes to see, notice what they do here, right? You've got the book of Isaiah, which contradicts the core teachings of Islam from beginning to end contradicts the Islamic view of God, contradicts the Islamic view of how we can be reconciled to God, contradicts Islam from beginning to end. Muslims go right into the middle of that book and say, it mentions Kedar. We've been vindicated by the book of Isaiah. Isn't it a miracle? Muhammad was right. Right. And but notice, that's what they'll do. They'll go to they'll do the exact same thing in the New Testament. They'll go to the book of John, which starts off in the very first verse by affirming the deity of Christ repeatedly affirms the inspiration, I mean, the, 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 uh, the incarnation of Jesus and his deity to the point where by the end, you've got Jesus' own apostles calling him my Lord and my God. Muslims will go right into the middle of that book in, of, in verses where Jesus is clearly speaking of the Holy Spirit, who in the context is repeatedly assigned the attributes of God. And Muslims will say, you see here? This is talking about Muhammad. It's so clear. Thank you, Book of John, for vindicating our religion and proving that Islam is true. My real question is, guys, if you have the true religion, does the true religion require you to keep going to books that repeat you? I mean, that, re that refute you from beginning to end and say, and pull out some completely ridiculous application to Muhammad and say, this is our end. This is our this is our, our clear proof that Muhammad is a prophet of God. I saw it on a YouTube video where he didn't mention anything about the context. He didn't mention anything. He just said, it says Qadar. It says Qadar right there. This is proof. It's our religion. Guys, are you serious? Just tell me, how, how do you not see this? Yeah. How, how do you not see that? I mean, especially when it's, when, it's, when, it's, when it's put right in front of your face. All right, we have about uh, uh, 11 or 12 minutes left, Sam, but let's go ahead and interact yep. with Aladdin here. He says, yeah, David, I accept your challenge now, live, to prove Allah spoke from the fire and tree as you claim. You uh, are distortion, the meaning of the verses, to sweet your false Trinitarian faith like you did with the Tanakh. Now notice, he's once again appealing, he's once again saying <laughs> that the, the rabbis who reject Christianity are authoritative when they talk about Jewish scripture. 
And so he's once again called on all of us to reject Jesus as the Messiah and to regard Jesus as a false prophet, in which case, if Jesus was a false prophet, if Jesus was not the Messiah and Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, then Muhammad was a false prophet and the Quran is false. So here again, Allah Dean just called on everyone to reject Islam and he has tried to convince yeah. us that Islam is false, right? Yeah. Now, I want people to reject Islam as well, but not for this silly reason, not just because you say, oh, a person of a, of a different religion says that, that it's not true. Therefore, this person is distorting everything. That, that's horrible. That, that's horrible, horrible reasoning. And yet that's what we find repeatedly from al -Adim. But he says, yeah. uh, you are distortion, the meaning of the verses to sweet your false Trinitarian faith. Now, Sam, did, did we did we did we go to do we go to that passage to prove the Trinity? None whatsoever. No, nope. I, I don't recall. Didn't. I don't recall. I don't recall even anything. attempting. Yeah. yeah. No, we didn't quote Isaiah or any of the fruit of the Trinity. Well, he's, talk, no. he's, ta he's talking about the uh, the the burning bush. No, he's saying we that we, yeah, yeah, we proved the. We he mentioned the rabbis in the Tanakh. He's he's all over the place. First it's Quran, then rabbis in Tanakh. No. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, anyway, the whole point is the Quran says what it says. If David is a liar, that means Allah is the worst communicator in history. Yeah. Just that. Yeah. And it. so. Uh, uh, just to clarify things for Aladdin, because he now, Sam, have you noticed this from Muslims? No. Yeah. Now, the, re, the reason in case in case Aladdin missed it, because he obviously did, unless he did understand, in which case he's deliberately trying to distort us, distort what we said. What we actually said, the, the, the reason for bringing that up is Muslims object to the doctrine of the incarnation by just pretending that Allah can't enter creation. That's right. right? Right, yeah. That Allah can't appear that way, right? And so yep. we, we appeal to Muslim sources to say that's not even true according to your own religion. It's not yep. even true. We understand that it's false according to Islam to claim the deity of Christ. We understand that. But if yep. your basis for rejecting the doctrine of the incarnation is oh, God just can't do that, that's false according to your own religion, right? Sam brought yes. up passages from the Hadith where Allah has to descend. He has to he has to move through the universes to get to come down to hear prayer. So Allah is moving around. Well, if Allah if <laughs> Allah is moving around to hear your prayers, obviously he's he's moving around and he he is in creation. If he's moving through the seven heavens, he's he's to come down to this heaven, then he's obviously physically present in somehow or present in some sense, right? So so could that same God enter a fire and speak out of the fire? You can say no, but then you're just you're, it's just hopelessly clear, right? No, David, you need to go to the YouTube channel. Truth prevails. Ya kafir. Yeah. And I need to believe whatever they say and just completely ignore what the Muslim sources say. Right. Allah yeah. speaks from the fire and says, blessed is he who is in the fire and says, I am Allah. And the Muslims here are enraged and calling us liars and distorters for saying, well, that's Allah speaking out of the fire. You liars. You liars distorting everything. We you said kid, we pointed to Isaiah and Kedar. We're not dishonest here. That we're no. we're completely truthful. Yeah. And by the way, you know, you are a liar for just taking the plain reading of the Quran. You need a scholar and alim to correct you, ya kafir. Mm -hmm. with you, man. All right. So just just to reiterate, we claim that Jesus is God incarnate, right? God become yeah. flesh. We don't claim that on the basis of the Quran. We don't care what the Quran says about that, right? We claim that because that's what Scripture reveals, right? The Old Testament prophesied that it would happen, and then the New Testament reveals that the prophecy was fulfilled. You guys who claim to believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament then throw all of it out, even though it's prophesied in the Old Testament and confirmed in the New Testament, and your Scripture tells us to believe in our Scripture and to stand upon our Scripture and to judge by our Scripture, and yet you call, and yet when we point out what our Scripture says, you say it's all a lie. Right. So then in order to help you understand that you shouldn't say, oh, God can't do that. We point to your scriptures. Right. We point to your prophet saying, of course, you can see Allah. You'll see him just as clearly as you see the moon. He's going to pull up. He's going to pull up his garment and show you his shin. Don't you think you're going to be seeing him there? Of course you are. And what do you guys say? This is a lie. We keep quoting yeah. your, your sources just to show you you need to stop using the silliest objections that we've ever heard, objections that refute your own sources. Now, by the way, everyone, we, we, we've, we've been pointing this out. Do you see how the objections they're using? Oh, you guys are lying to say this. Well, then your prophet's a liar, too. Uh, you Ah, the Jewish rabbi would, would, would reject your interpretation. He'd reject your interpretation, too. 
Do you see how over and over and over again they just do not care if their argument, when turned against Islam, would refute Islam? They just don't care. So the real goal... The real goal is not to establish Islam. The real goal is to attack Christ. That's why we say anti-Christ religion. David, you still don't get it. <laughs> the website, YouTube page, Truth Prevail, refuted you. Accept it, man. What's wrong with you? Just go to the you YouTube page, right, everyone? Shh, man. By the way, if people are wondering why we're mocking these arguments, it's Proverbs 26.5. Proverbs 26.5, it says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he becomes wise in his own mind. So sometimes you got to show how silly these arguments are by way of sarcasm and mockery. I mean, come on, guys. Muslims, may the Holy Spirit of God convict you to see the truth because your arguments are so bad and so dishonest. Only Jesus can set you free. So, And, and, and guys, uh, uh, Sam, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to uh, uh, sum up with uh, the gospel since we've covered a number of issues. But I did just want to show where the arguments actually go, right? We, did we or did we not give the Muslims here repeated opportunities to yes. show where we're wrong, to show where our belief in the deity of Christ and the incarnation is wrong? And have they come up with anything, anything which they could apply consistently to their own to their own sources? Absolutely not. All right. And the thing is, with the Muslims, as I've said about Shabir Ali, and I'm going to repeat it again, it seems like the ends do justify the means. Mm -hmm. They will use the most inconsistent, dishonest, <clears throat> deceitful arguments. Arguments from, let's say, liberal scholarship that can be used against Muslims more forcefully. But it doesn't matter because as long as they can attack and destroy Christianity in the minds of people, then the ends justify the means. And I've said it and I'm going to repeat it again. The kind of God you serve will impact the kind of person you turn out to be. Not always, because people may profess to be, let's say, Christians, but don't know Jesus really. So they're not imitating Jesus. But if you truly follow Jesus, you cannot help but to imitate him, because the Holy Spirit conforms you to the image of Christ. In the case of Muslims, their own God boasts about being the greatest deceiver of them all. So why would it shock us that if their God is, is boasting as being the best of all deceivers, can't be out deceived by anyone, the greatest conniver. Why would it shock us that his followers, his faithful adherents, also adopt the same attitude of using <clears throat> deceitful, inconsistent, dishonest arguments? We should expect it until the Holy Spirit sets them free to know the true God revealed in Jesus Christ, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and, and here, uh, I, I just wanted to say, notice what, what happens. Uh, the Muslims keep using arguments and we keep refuting them. And where do these things end? Where does the discussion eventually lead? Here we have from Awesome Dude. I have to censor some of this. Um, so just don't read what he said on the screen and cover your ears for a second. Well, I, I won't, I won't re re repeat what he said, but he said, David Wood and Sam Shamoon, come down here to Adams Avenue, Paulsboro, New Jersey, and I will censor you up. He has a picture <laughs> of a knife and a gun there. Why are you so scared? Censor. <laughs> so so, so that, that's the end result of, of, of this theological discussion we tell muslims ahead of time we're going to come on here we're going to discuss the deity of christ we're going to discuss the incarnation you can bring your questions we'll be happy to answer them and we respond to their objections we answer their questions and the, res and the response we get is uh come down here uh so i can stab and shoot you why are you so scared that's that's the res <laughs> that's the response we get now yeah. sam yes <clears throat> these guys obviously need the gospel. They need Amen. Jesus. So why don't you tell them what the gospel yes. is? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit, here's what the gospel is. And I want everyone over over the next couple of days, because we're celebrating Christmas, the birth, the conception birth of the God man, <clears throat> read Matthew chapter one, read Luke chapter one and two, read John chapter one. Because there you're going to be told that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. In Matthew 1, 21 and 23, we are told that Jesus will be called Yeshua in Hebrew, because in English you don't see the significance of the name. The angel tells Joseph she will give birth to a son, and you are to name him. Now your translation says Jesus. The Greek says Isus, which is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Yeshua, and then explains why. Here's the good news, Muslims. Here's the good news, Christians. Here's the good news for the entire world. Because he will save his people from their sins. The Hebrew word Yeshua is the shortened form of Yehoshua. And that basically means 
Yahovah or Yahweh, as it's commonly <clears throat> pronounced, is salvation. So the angel is saying, this baby, this child will be born. He will be Jehovah is salvation because he's Jehovah coming in the flesh to save his people from their sins. And then Matthew says this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, <clears throat> what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son and they shall call him Emmanuel, which interpreted means God with us. What you're celebrating this Christmas is the birth of God Almighty. And by the way, here's what's beautiful. Matthew 1, 23, when he translates the name Emmanuel, in English you see it says God with us. It actually says in the Greek, folks, ha theos is with us. Not a God, the God of heaven has come to dwell with us in that manger because he condescended to be born as a babe in order to go to the cross and do for us what we could not do for ourselves so that he can reconcile creation to himself so we can enjoy him forever and ever. And I want to conclude with John 1, 14 and 18. John 1, 14 says, The word became flesh and tabernacled among us, pitched his tent. That physical body was the physical tent of God who now is in flesh. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he came with the fullness of grace, the truth. Why? Because John 1.18 tells you, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has come to explain him. So what you're celebrating this Christmas is, Jesus Christ, the God of heaven, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, yet one with them in essence, becomes flesh to make known God to us, and to save us from his wrath so we can enjoy him forever and ever. We are celebrating the birth of the God-man. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to us and remaining with us by your spirit. We love you, Son of God. Emmanuel has come, God with us. That's the gospel. That's the Christmas message. That's the good news for mankind. All right. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, uh, everyone who showed up, everyone, uh, the Christians and uh, the, the Muslims who showed up. And we know you guys didn't have very good arguments, but uh, we're glad that you keep coming back and interacting. And we hope you actually um, we hope you guys actually pay attention to what's being said. When 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 you use an argument, you think it's this slam dunk argument. And then we show you what your sources actually say or what the Bible actually says. Uh, if you are at all concerned about truth. We hope that you would actually go and look these things up and take a closer look. Don't just force everything around you to fit in with your Islamic belief because everything doesn't fit with your Islamic belief because Islam is false. And so we're glad to have these times where we invite you to uh, to join us here and to ask uh, ask questions and have discussions. Now, uh, again, on Wednesday, this Wednesday evening, our plan is to um, address some Concerns from a former Muslim who then became a Christian but is struggling with a lot of issues in Christianity. So we're actually going to go uh, through some of those. And after that, we'll just be answering questions. But we hope you'll join us for the issues that are brought up because they're very important issues for both Christians and Muslims. So uh, hope you're all looking forward to that. We'll see you again on Wednesday, Lord willing. God bless everyone. Merry Christmas.